Hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, zooming to you all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa. We are currently locked down at level four with the COVID-19 third wave wreaking havoc. So I hope that wherever you find yourselves this evening, that you and your loved ones are safe and doing what you can to limit the spread of this dreadful disease. Our thoughts go out to the many families affected by the pandemic, as well as to those who have lost loved ones. Now tonight, we highlight yet another fantastic raptor conservation project at BirdLife South Africa. And Christian Brink and I will be sharing some of the insights into the critically endangered Southern Banded Snake Eagle Conservation Project. But before we begin, please remember that you, our audience, can communicate with us using the Zoom chat room and questions for our speakers can be posted into the Q&A box throughout this webinar. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions, and we will answer these at the end of the webinar. If you'd like to get in touch via our social media channels, please use the hashtag Conservation Conversations. All of our previous episodes are available on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel and our podcast. We'd like to ask all of you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel to help us grow support for our video content, and tell your friends to also subscribe. Let's cross that 1,000 subscriber threshold that we're getting so close to. We are half a year into the season of conservation conversations. And if you are enjoying the series and can afford to support it financially, every little bit helps us to keep this webinar free for all to learn and enjoy. Simply scan the Cricut QR code on screen or visit our Conservation Conversations website to find the link to the donations tab. A big thank you to everyone that has donated so far. Registrations for the second Virtual African Bird Fair are open. This year's event is set to take place on 30 and 31 July 2021. Book your spot for our incredible lineup of speakers and workshops, which includes the likes of Chris Packham, who is a UK-based conservation television presenter, as well as David Lindo, the urban birder. Visit our website to find out more. Now tickets are almost sold out for BirdLife South Africa's annual jackpot birding competition, where you stand a chance to win a 100,000 Rand cash prize with an additional three prizes valued at 10,000 Rand each. Entry into the draw is only 500 Rand per ticket and all proceeds go towards giving conservation wings. Be sure to bag your chance to win this exciting prize by visiting the BirdLife South Africa website. Now it gives me great pleasure to welcome BirdLife South Africa's Raptor and Large Terrestrial Bird Project Manager, Christian Brink, to your screens for his debut appearance on Conservation Conversations. Christian is a seasoned field biologist, having spent two years on the sub-Antarctic Marion Island, working as both a sealer and a seabird monitor. Christian is currently completing his PhD on the role of artificial feeding sites in vulture conservation at the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology, whilst also managing the Raptor Project at BirdLife South Africa. So he really is a hard worker getting a PhD wrapped up with his busy schedule at BirdLife. One of the chapters from his PhD was recently awarded the Ostrich Journal of African Ornithology's best student paper in 2020. And Christian has also carried out an immense amount of work in his first six months with BirdLife South Africa. And we look forward to watching him grow into his raptor conservation role that will ultimately save some of Africa's most threatened birds, including my favorite, the secretary bird. Now tonight, we look forward to hearing about the work that has been carried out as part of BirdLife South Africa's Southern Banded Snake Eagle project. So Christian, if you wouldn't mind just greeting our audience, I will get your presentation loaded up. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure, Melissa. Uh, thank you everyone for the opportunity to chat to you this evening. And uh, hello, I hope everyone is staying warm. Luckily, we're having a little bit warmer weather and uh, let's hope that holds. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Christian. Over to your presentation and we will touch base with you afterwards for questions. Evening, everyone. My name is Christian Willem Brink and I am the Raptors and Large Terrestrial Bird Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa. And tonight I'm going to be chatting to you about one of the species in my diverse portfolio of conservation projects, South Africa's rarest snake eagle, the Southern Banded Snake Eagle. Now, first off, just to shock and awe you, on the screen there, you can see the diverse range of characters we have here in Southern Africa. Now, those are all species you can see in South Africa. 
And we are quite lucky if you look at the world stage, we rank quite highly in species diversity concerning raptors. We have about 80 species in the country, and it's a great place to be if you are a raptor enthusiast such as I am. Unfortunately, raptors across the globe aren't doing that well. Now, these graphs on the screen is from a study by McClure et al., who basically reviewed uh, the conservation status of raptors across the globe. So when I refer to a conservation status, I'm talking about the category assigned to a species by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Now, this category basically indicates how likely it is that a species will go extinct, and it's assigned based on things like um, population numbers, population trajectories, habitat availability, and that type of thing. So if you talk, look at the top left uh, graph, you can see that uh, almost a quarter of uh, all raptors are threatened with extinction um, over there. Uh, noteworthy as well to mention that we are experiencing an African vulture crisis with the majority of our vulture species facing a serious risk of extinction. But also if we look uh, down um, one figure, you can see that the majority of raptor species are declining, um, which is, of course, quite a worry. And if we look on the right there, we pretty much have a list of the main threats that are threatening our raptors. And I'd just like to highlight two because, of course, they'll become relevant later on in this talk. The first being agriculture and logging, um, and the second being energy uh, infrastructure which leads to collisions and electrocutions, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So in 2015, uh, BirdLife South Africa produced this publication, the ESCOM Red Data Book of Birds, and this is basically a regional assessment of the conservation status of all our species of birds. And what we learned from this is that uh, our raptors aren't faring any better than those globally, uh, with 22 out of the 80 uh, species being at risk of extinction, and we even had six critically endangered species. Now, four of these were vultures, and the other two were actually species that I work on. Firstly, the tighter falcon, and secondly, our guest of honor this evening, the southern banded snake eagle. And there it is in all its glory. On the left there, you can see a beautiful southern banded snake eagle. Now I'm going to start off this section by just giving you an overview of the biology of this uh, very special, interesting, uh, and quite unknown species, uh, starting off with its call so that you can identify it when you hear it in the field, and I'm going to play that for you now. And there you go. As you can hear, it sounds something like a very majestic chicken. Um, and we'll head on now to uh, look at some field identification. So, of course, these birds have changing uh, plumage colorations as they grow, which, of course, makes uh, identifying them harder, as most birds will know. Uh, it can be quite frustrating trying to uh, differentiate between uh, brownish, eagle-looking things. So uh, in the first year, the bird looks like this, uh, actually quite pretty with that pale coloring, some slight browny blotches, but uh, a very pale body, uh, quite an attractive uh, plumage if you ask me. But unfortunately, in their second year, they turn into plain old brown snake eagles, such as you can see there. But luckily, when they reach sub-adulthood, they start getting some of the that barring on the chest. And when they're adults, uh, they have that uh, plumage that you can see on the screen there. They also have a very characteristic double white band on their tails, which is where their scientific name comes from, as well as their Afrikaans name, the double bunt slung ardent. So there you go. That's how you, uh, how you can recognize them when you see them in the field. We're not exactly sure how long it takes them to reach their adult plumage, but current guesstimate is that it should take anywhere between five and seven years. So these birds are forest specialists, and they mostly inhabit coastal dune forests, such as the ones you can see on the screen there. 
And in South Africa, this habitat is located within the Indian Ocean coastal belt biome, which is this blue area you can see down here, that slight sliver there. And for those of you who don't know what a biome is, basically you can think of it as a habitat type that's characterized by the dominant vegetation in that habitat. And if we look at the global coverage, you can see that these birds occur pretty much from Somalia all the way down into Mozambique, uh, and then South Africa having the most southern population. And if we zoom into that uh, and look where, at where the best places are to see these birds, uh, you can see that uh, according to the Sabap 2 pentads, it is here in the St. Lucia area. Now, Sabap 2 is just the South African Bird Atlas Link Project, and a pentad is each one of those blocks and they're pretty much just colored based on how often the birds are seen in those areas. Now, like I said, these birds are forest specialists and they occupy the ecotone between the coastal evergreen forests at the back there and lowland grasslands, which is an open area in the front here. Now, when I refer to an ecotone, I'm pretty much talking about the transitioning line between to habitats. And uh, the birds use those uh, evergreen forests to breed and roost in. On the left there, you can see a bird roosting or hiding from the midday heat in the forest. And on the right, you can see some very rare photographs of birds breeding in Southern Africa. So the birds then use these uh, open grassland areas to hunt in and they're looking for their favorite prey, which are frogs and lizards, but of course also snakes. Um, so this group sort of makes uh, up the majority of their food, roughly 80%, and um, they are perch hunters. So what they'll do is they'll uh, perch on dead snags on the edge of the forest uh, and scan the landscape for their favorite prey. And once they spot them, of course they have very good eyesight, they're raptors, They'll swoop down and grab them. And uh, there you can see a bird that has caught a frog at the bottom and one in the top right that has caught a vine snake. And it's busy dispatching its head before eating the rest of the body. And um, apparently this is some of their favorite prey and uh, they uh, like to hunt in the early mornings. So this is some of the best time to see them when they come out of the dense forest. Yeah, so be up early. Uh, if you're going to go out uh, trying to tick one of these off. So why are we interested in this bird? Well, of course, we are a conservation NGO, and this bird is regionally critically endangered. We have a declining population, and current estimates are that there are less than 50 mature individuals. Now, those dots on the screen there, that's 50 dots. That's a handful of birds. So not a lot of birds uh, down south at the moment. And they also have a, a declining geographic range. Globally, however, they are only classified as near threatened, but their population is also declining and their geographic range. And by the end of the talk, hopefully you'll agree that it's warranted to uplist the species to a higher conservation category. This near threatened category has last been assigned in 2004. So a real need to update that. So one of the reasons these birds are threatened is due to habitat loss. Uh, across Africa, a lot of uh, natural landscapes or habitat has been transformed into anthropogenic landscapes, um, things such as agriculture or plantations um, and human settlement. Um, and uh, if you look on the right there, uh, all those pink areas are areas where we've lost forest cover in the last 20 years. And apparently Africa has lost more than 50% of its forest coverage in the last 20 years. And this is according to a study done by Hansen et al. If we look at the Seven Banded Snake Eagle Range, you'll see that quite a lot of this forest loss has been happening in Tanzania and Mozambique. So if we look at uh, KwaZulu-Natal itself, which is where we expect to find the species in South Africa, you can see there on a the map on the left that in 1994, we had about 73% of the province being natural habitat. 
um, which is that gray area there, while the black area is the anthropogenically transformed habitat. And by 2011, we only had 53% of, of the province being natural habitat. So quite a lot of habitat transformation occurring and a lot of it being here on the coastline where we expect to find our seven banded snake eagles. Now this habitat has been transformed to various other land uses such as sugarcane, plantations and of course human settlement. And as populations continue to increase, this is only likely to become more of a problem in future. Another threat to these birds is that of power infrastructure. So you can see from these photographs that these birds like to perch on things like power lines, which is a convenient perch for them to hunt from. But of course, this leads to the risk of being electrocuted. You can see at the top left there, uh, a bird perched very close to a live wire. He just needs to uh, lean forward slightly and he will basically go up and smoke. Unfortunately, uh, being snake eagles, they hunt snakes, and this doesn't really help the situation because that snake dangling down there on the right is pretty much a nice conductor rod. So if the bird on the left was uh, holding a snake, and that might then dangle down and make contact with some of the live parts of uh, that power line and therefore also electrocute the bird. So given these threats, BirdLife South Africa decided to start a project on the species. Now, uh, we first did some uh, preliminary work, and this entailed Dr. Andrew Jenkins and David Allen going down to Northern KwaZulu Natal in 2015 to understand the landscape, identify role players, and to build networks for the project going forward. Then in 2016, Dr. Shane McPherson was hired as a researcher uh, on this project, and uh, he surveyed the Mutazini area, which is two hours north of Durban and has long been believed to be one of the strongholds for the species. He had some groundbreaking discoveries, uh, one being finding the fourth known nest site in South Africa, or identified nest site, which is that circle there. And as you can see, this was no easy task. The nest is in that patch of trees there and the bird is outlined in that picture above. So quite difficult to spot. And another reason this was a groundbreaking discovery was because previously it was thought that these birds were mostly restricted to protected areas. But uh, Shane found this nest site in the forestry landscape. You can see the nest was here in a, a patch of natural forest, pretty much surrounded by plantations. And this was a very interesting discovery. The project was then handed over to Dr. Melissa Whitecross, who you'll hear from again a little bit later. Um, and uh, the project structure was basically built out and we identified the main information that we, we need to get at in order to conserve the species. The first being getting an understanding of uh, where these birds are. And to do this, we uh, aim to produce a fine scale and regional distribution map through using techniques such as species distribution modeling, as well as investigating habitat use and movement. Now the data we need to do these type of analyses is uh, citizen science data, such as uh, from birders that uh, see the bird and uh, record its location. Um, we're doing some telemetry studies or tracking studies. We're doing annual surveys for the bird and we're doing some GIS and remote sensing work on their habitat. Uh, the second question is then how many of these birds are left? also an important thing to monitor so that we know what the impact of our conservation initiatives are. So to get a robust national population estimate, we need the information I already discussed, but we also need to look at things such as breeding biology through our annual surveys and our telemetry studies, but also through things like camera traps. And then we also need to audit all the threats that this species faces including habitat loss and an audit on the electrical infrastructure that endanger these birds. So firstly, looking at how we answer the question of where these birds are, we conducted species distribution models, 
by using that citizen science uh, data I talked about. Now, this data comes from a range of platforms, including BirdLasser, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, eBird, and the African Raptor Data Bank. And basically, we curated this data, removed errors, and removed some of the biases. And what you get is what you can see there on the map on the left, um, with all our occurrence data shown as white dots. Now, we also needed some environmental variables. So we looked at things such as uh, climate, uh, things like minimum temperatures in winter, maximum temperatures in summer, rainfall, rainfall seasonality, that type of thing. We had some topographical uh, variables such as slope, altitude, that type of thing. Um, and then we also looked at land cover such as soil type as well as land use. So firstly, what we do is uh, we uh, use 80% of our occurrence data, which are those white dots, to train the model. And we retain 20% of the data basically to after the fact test how well our model is uh, is predicting um, some, the suitability of the habitat for some mammoth snake eagles. So basically what these sort of species distribution models do is they look at a site where you say to the model some mammoth snake eagles occur here and it looks at the environmental variables at that site and then it pretty much predicts on uh, for different areas what the likelihood or suitability is uh, of that area for southern band snake eagle eagles based on those environmental variables. But of course, not all the environmental variables will end up being important predictors of uh, habitat suitability for southern band snake eagles. So we refine our model by removing some of the redundant variables, and then we rebuild the model, and we get an output such as this. Now, you can see on the right there, the blue areas are the areas with higher habitat suitability for southern banded snake eagles. And this is quite a fine resolution model we came up with, which uh, is about uh, a 30 meter resolution. Um, and this one is specific uh, for South Africa. If we dig down a little bit deeper into the model, uh, you'll see that basically the minimum temperature of the coldest month came out as the, the best predictor for whether the habitat is suitable for southern banded snake eagles. So basically these birds like warm areas, they stay away from the colder areas. Um, and the second most important variable was of course land cover. We also built a slightly coarser model for the whole of the distribution of the species, which you can see on there on the right, with the redder areas being the more suitable areas for the species. Uh, and this model had a re resolution of about 100 meters um, and also used uh, slightly fewer environmental variables as uh, less variables are available at that broader scale. If we go back to our South African model, however, you can see on the left there, those encircled areas uh, coming up as quite blue, so quite suitable for southern mountain snake eagles. And interestingly, these areas, which are shown in purple here, are all forestry areas. So those are basically plantations. Now, of course, uh, this leads us further down the road towards uh, concluding that this might be suitable habitat uh, for the species, and it thus becomes important for us to consider this habitat. So in order to ground truth uh, these predictions, uh, as well as build on the work that was done by Shane, Melissa Whitecross and the team went down to um, the Richards Bay area. You can see on the left there, those yellow highlighted areas is pretty much where they traveled through. And they surveyed those areas uh, to see if they could find any southern band snake eagles. And um, they basically did this by playing the callback uh, that I played to you at the start of the talk every 500 meters, trying to elicit a response from southern band snake eagle. And what they found was very interesting and surprising. So the general perception was that these sort of plantations and forestry landscapes are quite species poor. But Melissa then managed to survey 22 pentads from the Sabap, uh, from Sabap 2, and they identified 257 different bird species, uh, which is 
a whole lot. And um, you can see in the center list there, um, all the uh, raptors they saw, which is a wide variety of raptors, uh, as well as some of the species they saw on the left there. But most interestingly, they managed to just in this forest block, you can see on the screen there, identify five different uh, Southern Banded Snake Eagle territories within this landscape. So of course, we want to understand how these birds persist in this anthropogenic landscape. And we started a telemetry study. So Melissa again went uh, down into Northern KwaZulu Natal and uh, managed to deploy the first two ever tracking devices uh, on Southern Band Snake Eagles. And what I'm going to show you now is some of the first ever movement data we have on the species. So Melissa then managed to tag both a male and female bird, and you can see their movement data on the right there. And we're starting to understand how these birds function. You can see that they stick within quite these small and narrow territories, um, with the male being indicated by the blue dots and the blue circle, and the female by the pink dots and the pink circle. So if we just you look at the male's data, you'll see that he is even venturing into Mutuzini town itself over there. And if we zoom into a part of uh, the habitat he uses, um, the issue of habitat loss becomes very apparent. You can see uh, the bird using some of this natural forest, um, which is pretty much surrounded by either intensive agriculture or a mining activity happening on the right there, and even a highway passing through the area. So we wanted to quantify this habitat loss across the African range of the species because um, we wanted to provide this information to BirdLife International's Red List team, which is re-evaluating the conservation status of this species later this year. So we used our species distribution model or habitat suitability model, which is in the center there. And uh, we looked at how much forest has been lost within different tiers of habitat suitability or the probability of occurrence for the species. Now, uh, you can see down here at the highest tier, the 80% tier, uh, the, the species has lost 19% of its prime habitat across Africa in the last rough, roughly 20 years. And this is quite worrisome, of course. And uh, if we zoom to South Africa, you'll see that uh, that little section there, which comes up as very yellow as most ideal area for the species, that's where we're losing most of the forests. And that just highlights the need for us to start engaging with the forestry industry in South Africa to ensure that we uh, keep these pockets of natural forests that the birds can potentially breed there. And uh, hopefully this can then uh, be substitute habitat for the species. So if we were going to speculate as to why this habitat um, might be allowing the birds to persist, we can see that this whole area has sort of been engineered to provide uh, a suitable hunting area for them. You can see next to this road, we have an open cleared area, a young stand of trees in the back there, all constituting open area. And right next to it, we have placed convenient hunting perches with a big forest in the back where they can roost and hide from the heat of the day. But unfortunately, if we are going to uh, accept these, this habitat, substitute habitat, we need to ensure that it's safe. And there are some structures in the landscape that pose a threat to these birds, especially these transformer boxes you can see on the screen there. Now, these transformer boxes have live jumper cables that go up from the transformer box itself to that cross beam. And if the bird comes into contact with that, he will be electrocuted, such as this first year bird you can see in the bottom right corner. And I'm going to give it over to uh, Melissa to tell us more about some of her very successful work in mitigating this threat throughout this landscape. Thank you so much, Christian. So back in 2018, when I took over the Southern Banded Snake Eagle project, one of the things that we knew we needed to tackle was this threat of electrical transformer boxes within the northern Zululand landscape. 
So on your map here, you've got a preliminary habitat suitability model, which we developed, really trying to target the most suitable habitat for Southern Banded Snake Eagle. And that's illustrated by the pale blocks uh, all along that northern KwaZulu-Natal coast. We've also identified all of the protected areas within this landscape, and that largely constitutes the Isimangalisal Wetland Park, where these birds are being currently found. Now, EWT has a database of electrocution records, and they have identified at least four known electrocutions, one of which was up in Sodwana Bay. You can see the red lightning bolt to the top of the map. The other three took place in and around the St. Lucia town area. So we realized that we needed to try and prioritize which of these electrical transformer boxes were the biggest threat to our southern banded snake eel population. And so we mapped them across the habitat suitability uh, model that we developed, and we identified different tiers of transformer boxes. So transformer boxes, which were in habitat that was at least 75% suitable or more. So really, really suitable habitat for these birds. Then we had a 50% suitability or more, which was a slightly less priority area. And then of course, 25% suitability. So some level of suitability for these birds, but not necessarily the most suitable habitat. And then we needed to prioritize these known transformer boxes. So our highest priority to look at for mitigation was transformer boxes that fell within both the Southern Banded Snake Eagle range that was 75% or more and within any known protected area. So these were the ones that we really targeted first. Following on from that, we looked at boxes that were still inside Southern Banded Snake Eagle range, but outside of protected areas. And our final tier was to look at transformer boxes which were found within protected areas, but fell outside of the Southern Banded Snake Eagle range. And so after our analyses, we found in the different tiers, there were 21 priority transformer boxes that fell both within Southern Banded Snake Eagle suitable habitats and the protected area network. Moving on from that, we then identified a further 104 transformer boxes in our middle tier and our final tier had over 1,033. So certainly a lot of different structures to try and mitigate, but we knew exactly which ones were our biggest risk to our snake eagles. And so I took this research and presented it at the African Conference for Linear Infrastructure Ecology in Skakuza. And fortunately in the audience in 2019 happened to be a number of different industry role players two of which were senior ESCOM environmental executives. And they approached me at the end of my talk and said, we'd love to hear more about this. This is a priority species and a priority region for us. Can you please um, come down to Cousin Natal and present this to our KZN team? And let's see what we can do to try and help these critically endangered birds. So essentially how ESCOM goes about mitigating these structures is to take the live jumper cables, which you can see coming off of the box over here. Um, if a bird lands on top of that box and touches the live jumper cable, it will be electrocuted. So to prevent that from happening, they put these black insulating cables to now eliminate the risk of electrocution for any animal um, that lands on top of this transformer box. So essentially the story went like this. I presented those results in March, 2019. In April 2019, I was flown down to the KZN operations unit to discuss the start of Southern Banded Snake Eagle electrocution mitigation project. And in July 2019, we officially launched this project and the KZN operations unit headed out into the field to go and begin mitigation of these priority structures. And they identified 64 boxes, which they were willing to mitigate for us. And I'm very pleased to say that by the end of November 2019, 94% of those structures had actually been uh, mitigated. And we have now managed to complete all of those uh, mitigation structure initiatives. And all of these transformer boxes are now safe for our Southern Banded Snake Eagles. And I must give ESCOM huge kudos for completing this initiative. It certainly was something that has made a massive difference, not just for Southern Banded Snake Eagles, but all of the biodiversity within that landscape. And you can see all of the different ESCOM executives in that photo who were part and parcel of this project and we're very grateful to them for their support. So after that wonderful conservation success and hats off to Melissa and ESCOM for dealing with that, um, we wanted to investigate mitigation methods further but we realized that we could synergize our Southern Banded Snake Eagle project with the Mabula Ground Hornbill project because the Southern Ground Hornbills are also susceptible to being electrocuted by these structures. 
So we'll be collaborating with them to investigate various mitigation methods uh, as well in, uh, in an experimental way as well as out in the field. Um, and we'll be doing this mostly through the use of camera traps uh, to observe uh, how these animals interact uh, with these structures. And we hope that that would lead to some further good conservation outcomes. So looking at the future of the project, what we still need to do, well, we need to close firstly those knowledge gaps I've uh, identified uh, throughout the talk. We'll do this through uh, telemetry uh, study, increasing our sample size, uh, as well as placing some camera traps on nest sites if we're able to find them, um, and doing those investigations into various mitigation methods. Um, and then we also need to continue ground truthing our, our uh, species distribution models, and we'll do this through uh, things like our, our surveying, which will be an annual event, which I'll tell you more about in just a second. Um, and the reason we are doing that, or what we're aiming at uh, achieving in the future, is to have an accurate delineation of the available suitable habitat for the species, and to have a scientifically informed population estimate, and this will all help us in um, basically influencing the review of the global red list status so that we are sure to, to accurately identify what risks there are to the species and so that we can respond in the right manner. So after this talk, you might be enthusiastic about Southern Man Snake Eagles and keen uh, to uh, participate in its conservation. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a few ways in which you can do that. Firstly, you can please join us for our annual Zululand Snake Eagle Big Day. Now, this is basically just going to be a weekend where we're going to try and get as many people as possible out there looking for Southern Banded Snake Eagles across their range um, so that this can inform pretty much our, our population um, estimates for the species. So keep watching our website um, and social media, and uh, we'll tell you more about this uh, later on. Then during this event, as well as just generally, you can use Bird Lasser and contribute to some citizen science. Now, Bird Lasser is just an app where you pretty much record the birds you see. Um, if you are using the app, please go to Causes uh, in the settings and uh, be sure to tick um, the a bird life South Africa threatened species cause. Now this allows us to basically use your uh, data of all the birds you record for uh, our science and research and that guys our conservation. Um, and just a reminder that you are able to drag those location points uh, to exactly where you saw the bird um, and this will help increase the accuracy of our science. Please don't log them when you back home. Uh, and you remember what you saw on your vacation. Alternatively, you can donate to BirdLife South Africa using the Southern Banded Snake Eagle project as reference, and uh, that money will go towards this project. Uh, please visit our donations page. Um, your contribution will be greatly appreciated. Then, of course, to do this type of work, we uh, need to collaborate uh, with a lot of people and organizations. And they are all listed on the screen, and we uh, are very grateful for their support. So thank you very much to them, and thank you very much to you for listening to this talk. And I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, that you uh, will be able to identify a Southern Banded Snake Eagle when you see it in the field. Great. Thank you so much, Christian. That was absolutely fascinating. And I really appreciate all the effort that you put into uh, putting that talk together. So before we dive into some questions, and I see there are quite a few coming into our Q&A box, uh, just a reminder to everybody that as you exit our webinar this evening, you will receive a post-webinar survey. If you wouldn't mind just spending two minutes answering that for us and giving us some feedback on tonight's talk, we'd really appreciate that. And just a reminder that next week, we will have another one of our Sand Parks webinar series talks. We are really excited to have Mike Bridgeford coming through to join us and speak about birding in the Garden Route National Park. So be sure to tune in next week. 
Our Sandpark series webinars have certainly been one of the exciting ones, and uh, it really is good to have Mike on the show next week. So Christian, back to you. I see we've got lots of questions coming through, and uh, I think between the two of us, hopefully we'll be able to uh, answer some of them. And uh, I'm going to start off with a question that you very kindly typed the answer into, but for those who haven't managed to uh, read the Zoom Q&A box, um, Peter Nelson, who is one of our ESCOM colleagues, was asking how we go about um, actually catching these birds. Now, uh, we obviously use standard Belchatry traps, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it is a very specifically designed cage used for capturing raptors, and as Christian has typed in there, and there are nooses on top, which the bird gets tangled into and a very speedy uh, ringer heads in to try and retrieve the bird safely. But uh, we don't advocate for this unless you are a trained ringer like Christian. And uh, Christian, we're hopefully planning some more deployments later on in the year. Do you wanna expand a little bit on that and what we have planned for August? Sure, yeah. So currently we only have two birds uh, that we are tracking and generally with these tracking studies you want at least 10 birds to come to sort of any sort of uh, conclusion basically. Um, so we're planning to head down uh, into uh, KwaZulu Natal in August and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get out um, hopefully two extra deployments um, but at least one. Um, and in future, we'll continue to uh, increase that sample size. So, I mean, if any, anyone has uh, seven-banded seven snake eagles on their properties and they know of nest sites, please let us know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Christian. We're really looking forward to learning more about these incredible birds. I see we've got a question here from Ray asking around why mitigation wasn't taken for all ESCOM sites from the outset. Now, there's also a comment here from Mark talking about how expensive it can be. So on average, if you add up all the man hours and the, the team costs to get out and actually mitigate these transformer boxes, we are looking in the range of anywhere from 25 to 30,000 Rand per transformer box in, in carrying out these installations. So this is no small feat. And it really was a massive undertaking by ESCOM to take on those 64 boxes. Um, obviously, we are now very aware of the risks that these structures do pose to our wildlife. And I know that the ESCOM team, particularly with their strategic partnership with the Endangered Wildlife Trust, are trying to come up with new ways to mitigate these boxes in a safe way, like they've done with many of the distribution line poles. And we'll be doing some exciting research, as Christian alluded to, um, trying to figure out ways to make these current structures a little bit more safe for our wildlife. Christian, do you want to just speak a bit around some of the ideas you have to make these boxes a bit safer for our birds in general? So one of the things we want to investigate are basically rubber eyelashes, and it's just basically ways to deter them from using these platforms or these transform boxes as perches. Um, so it's basically discouraging that type of behavior, first off, just to get them not to use it. And secondly, we also want to see uh, sort of what the microecology is on these boxes. If there's potentially other animals or insects that are attracting the birds to these boxes. Uh, in the case of the seven-banded snake eagle, uh, it might plainly be that it's a convenient hunting perch, but it might also be that we're finding snakes and things um, going onto those transform boxes as well. I know that Sometimes they, they find electrocuted snakes in those boxes too. Um, so those are sort of the aspects we are, we are gonna be investigating. Fantastic, thanks Christian. And I see uh, Alison is just making a comment that she missed some of the talk because she had to step out. This will be on YouTube. Do not stress all of our conservation conversations talks are on YouTube. So if you did miss any aspect of the talk this evening, you can catch up on our Bird Life South Africa YouTube channel. Now, Christian, I see we've got a question from Imran asking whether Southern Banded Snake Eagles have been seen out of their range. Do you want to speak a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so in terms of uh, um, occurrence data, recent occurrence data, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of any instances, but um, the, the initial recordings as sort of prime habitat for this bird was in the Durban area which I think is about 100 kilometers south of the current range. Um, so historically, at least, they uh, used to occur, be more uh, widespread, at least along the coast. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know, Melissa, if you know of any uh, rare sightings uh, in the yeah, last so while, couple of years. We definitely picked up some uh, wide ranging juveniles and there are a handful of records going uh, slightly more inland from our, our more coastal records that we see. Um, so it's not unheard of to encounter these birds slightly inland, but they're definitely by no means heading up onto the high felt. And um, what they'll often do is track the really large riparian corridors coming off of the East Coast. And they have been known to, to pitch up sort of 50 kilometers inland from, from the coastal areas. But typically mm -hmm. the majority of these adults that are established in territories will be very close to the coastline in those low altitudinal drainage lines and swamp forests. So, so more northern Africa, I assume uh, a lot of these inland sort of sightings are along these sort of big river systems as well. Um, yeah, that's absolutely correct, Christian. And you sort of spoke about those key factors in the habitat distribution model. Obviously, the closer to the equator you get, uh, the less cold mm -hmm. weather becomes a, a factor and really delving into those wet habitats where there is good reptilian and amphibious prey is uh, something these birds are certainly taking advantage of. Now, I see we've got a question here from Penny Abbott, um, speaking specifically to whether the Southern Banded Snake Eagle is the only snake eagle which is forest dwelling. So is this a niche that they have found to be beneficial? Do you want to speak to that a little bit, Christian? Uh, yeah, sure. I think if you compare them to the other snake eagles, we find, yeah, definitely they are the only one that's in these sort of thick forests. So definitely a niche that they discovered there. Um, uh, but I mean, if we talk further afield, I think the Western banded St. Eagle is also sort of a more forestry, forest, forestry species. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Those Western bandits, probably their closest cousin in the, the snake eagles here in Africa. And uh, they enjoy those, those big woody areas along the, the sort of Okavango into um, Caprivi region. Um, so really beautiful, beautiful birds to, to get up close to, not to be confused with our southern banded snake eagles, which are on the eastern side of Africa. Now, and two bands. Yes, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have to do a, a snake eagle ID course at some point, Christian. <laughs> so Penny is asking around how much a telemetry device costs. Would you like to just um, put that out there if anyone is interested in, in supporting the acquisition of more devices for this project, please? Yeah, so currently most of our devices are being sourced from overseas, uh, a Polish company, I think. Um, so getting it here, buying the device, as well as getting around about two years of data subscription is roughly around 25,000 Rand at the moment, basically. Fantastic. Now we've got another question here talking about are there enough snakes still in the wild to justify the name of the bird and support their diet? Now Imran, this is a, a really interesting observation and something I'm hoping any budding herpetologists out there would uh, like to look at with us. Um, I have never encountered so many snakes in my fieldwork career as I have walking through the coastal forests of northern Kwazulu Natal. Um, it is yeah. a very active reptile landscape and certainly a habitat which seems to do um, particularly snakes like your spotted bush snake and your vine snakes very well. Um, I happened to watch a southern bandit get flushed out of a raffia palm by a palm nut vulture and on its very casual sort of 10 meter flight out to get away from this palm nut vulture, it grabbed a spotted bush snake out of the top of one of the trees and proceeded to eat it. So there certainly are snakes and these birds are insanely good at spotting them with those very, very good eyes of theirs. And uh, it's, it definitely seems to be that there are still enough snakes in the wild to justify their name, at least in the well-preserved coastal forests. But I see we've got a comment from Ingrid Vaisby, I think it was, yes, talking about the Richards Bay Minerals Rehab Area. Now, this is an area that was mined um, for rare minerals and has been rehabbed over a number of different years. I think, Christian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, over 40 years in some cases, um, some of the areas there. We've had a number of students doing bird surveys and other um, surveys into the area to look at the recovery of biodiversity in this rehab site. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, and feel free anyone in the audience who has more up-to-date data, um, when I was there in 2018, there were still no southern banded snake eagles being recorded in these sites. Now, whether that speaks to a lack of um, potential prey species as the forest slowly recovers, um, I can't really say. We can only speculate. But certainly these apex predators 
have not taken up permanent residency in those rehab sites as yet. But it remains to be seen as to whether these forests can recover enough to welcome back the incredible biodiversity that was once there. Christian, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, so I did some uh, surveying there for about, uh, I can't remember, like three, four weeks for Siru. And they're doing some great rehabilitation work there. But it seems like, uh, from what I can remember from then, is that you do get some biodiversity returning, but you're not getting um, sort of the same biodiversity you would from uh, a fully functional forest or all the all growth forest. Or, and um, so not all the biodiversity is returning. Um, and it might be a function of that um, that's keeping them out of that, those habitats, I'm not sure. Absolutely, yeah, still lots to, to unpack in this very complex landscape that is Northern Positive Natal. Uh, we've got a question here from Clive Watson asking when you're going to publish the date of your Southern Banded Snake Eagle Day. Christian, it seems we've got some interest out there. Any ideas on roughly when we might aim to host this day? Yeah, so we were going to and throw a little bit in terms of deciding when they would be most conspicuous. So, of course, uh, when they have chicks and there's a chick calling, uh, we have the benefit of being able to find nest sites as well. Uh, if we do it later in the season, um, we might even see the young bird flying, learning to fly, which is even more conspicuous behavior. But then we might not be able to identify the nest itself. So at the moment, we're aiming around December um, to, to go look uh, to or to have the survey then. Um, yeah, I don't have a specific date yet, but keep watching the websites and social media. Definitely. And uh, we have asked for you to give us your details if you would like to participate in that in the post webinar survey. So please do drop us your email there. We will do our best to follow all puppy regulations that come into effect on the 1st of July. But uh, please do let us know if you would be interested and we will add you to the Southern Banded Snake Eagle mailing list. Now, I see our colleague Kishelen Chetty from ESCOM is asking a really interesting question. And he says, of the Southern Banded Snake Eagles counted in South Africa, how many are currently found in protected areas? And are there any plans for stewardship in possible sites that are not protected? So Christian, do you want to have a stab at this first and I'll speak to some of the stewardship work after that? Okay, 100%. Um, yeah, so quite a few of them um, aren't found, like I showed from uh, Melissa's survey that we're finding them in these plantation landscapes. Um, and of course, that is not protected area. Uh, in terms of actual numbers, I am not sure. I think Melissa, you guys uh, guessed around 93 territories. Uh, in South Africa of how many were in protected areas? Uh, I don't know if you remember. I, have, oh, yeah. I don't know. No, we'll have to, we'll have to go back and analyze we'll that. We'll have to double check. Okay. The, the vast majority of our sightings are within some kind of protected landscape. And interestingly, those natural pockets of forest, um, while not necessarily formally legislated under protection, the forestry industry has um, taken it upon themselves to conserve around 30% of their properties as natural forests. So there is a, a good chance that those forests will remain intact and we certainly are working with them to make sure that that remains the case. And uh, hopefully we will keep those pockets safe for not just our Southern bandits, but the many other species we managed to see in that plantation landscape. One of the last remaining areas where natural forests are still being safeguarded. But certainly uh, when it comes to stewardship, there is a lot of work to be done. And uh, we are looking at the landscape right across Northern Zululand, hopefully bringing in our Empowering People Program Manager, who will be based out in Northern Zululand very soon, and uh, looking to help work with uh, stakeholders that have potential Southern Banded Snake Eagle habitats and make sure that we are safeguarding that through any means necessary, whether it be stewardship or other conservation agreements that will help protect this important site. And I think something that's really important just to highlight at this junction is it's not just the forest that is super key for the species. As Christian showed, they are an ecotone species. And having these coastal grasslands and that interface between coastal forest and the grasslands where these birds hunt is absolutely key for the species to survive. And it's actually our coastal grasslands which have seen some of the biggest reductions in available habitats across northern KwaZulu-Natal. So certainly when it comes to safeguarding habitat for this bird, it's gonna be really important that we um, safeguard not just the 
uh, forests where they are roosting and breeding, but also that hunting ground adjacent to the forests with those coastal grasslands. And in doing so, hopefully we'll protect it for species like your black rump button quail, swamp nightjar, and other important KZN coastal grassland specials. Great, uh, Christian, let's see what else we've got to answer here. I see one of our colleagues, Reason, is uh, asking what is the regional or world population of these birds? And is there any present or prospect in terms of regional efforts that we are making to try and save these birds beyond our borders? Uh, so Reason, thanks for the question. Uh, I think the upper limit uh, guesstimate at the moment is 2,000, so less than 2,000 mature individuals. Um, in terms of regional efforts, um, we haven't gone that far yet. We're still focusing on the South African population. Um, luckily, these birds, just in terms of when we talk about birds, things like vultures, one individual may be flying across multiple different uh, countries. With the seven-banded snake eagles, they have quite narrow territories, So, as you saw from the tracking data. So they, they stick within... Um, quite a narrow territory. So we don't know about the juvenile dispersal yet, but potentially it would be easier to conserve birds that uh, are sort of more localized um, than ones like vultures that just roam all over the continent, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I must say that's, that's one of the really surprising findings we've had with our tracking data is just how tight a territory these birds hold. And I think that's also a a sort of relic of what habitat is actually available for them. Um, but luckily the small territories they do seem to dominate seem to have enough food for them to um, eke out their living there. And certainly the birds we've been working on in Umtanzini are living in a, a massive matrix of suburban forestry, mining and other land uses. So great to see these birds um, surviving and doing their thing. Now, I see we've got a question here from Sitem Biso. It's great to have you on the show again, Sitem Biso. Um, any nesting sites observed? Now, Christian, you alluded to how many nests have been found in the past. Um, do you want to just speak to why it is that we've got such low nest site observations thus far? Yeah, well, basically, it's just because the forests are so dense. Uh, it's very hard to, to follow these birds to where they disappear to within the forest. Um, so, yeah, it took uh, Shane quite a lot of effort to discover that one nest and uh, yeah it's just not something that's easily done. Absolutely so if anybody does know of any uh, nesting sites please do get in touch with Christian. We are hoping to expand our understanding of these birds breeding behavior and biology and hopefully we'll be deploying some non-invasive camera traps to help us understand what's going on with these birds, what they're feeding on and what's happening with the chicks. Um, certainly that rare a uh, set of photographs that Hugh Chittenden very kindly allowed us to use showing the breeding parents coming in with snakes. Um, one of the, the few collections of images of these birds breeding in the world. So very, very special to see that. And hopefully, Christian, with your dedicated effort, we'll be able to expand some of our understanding of what is going on with these birds at their nest site. So I think with that, I see we are just about to go eight o'clock. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we haven't gotten to all the questions this evening once again, but we really do appreciate all of you pitching them. And hopefully Christian can touch on any of the ones that we didn't quite get to. Um, and Peter, just to comment, sadly, it was not a snake in the bell chat that we used to, to capture our Southern Banded Snake Eagles. But I'll, I'll leave that to your imagination as to what we did use. And uh, Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in this evening. We really do appreciate the support. And Christian, we look forward to seeing this project grow from strength to strength. And all the best to you as you drive the conservation of this incredible species. And I look forward to exploring KZN with you a little bit later this year and seeing if we can help these birds a bit more. If you'd like Thank to you very much, Melissa. Cool. Yeah. If you'd like to say anything in closing, you're welcome to before I wrap us up. No, just uh, thank you everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we hope to have you involved in that survey at the end of the year. Hopefully by then we can all uh, travel out of the province. Definitely. From your lips to whichever deities is you would like to uh, pray to. Thank you so much, Christian. I really appreciate you coming on this evening and all the effort you put into that fantastic talk this evening. To everyone else, please stay safe. Uh, keep your eyes on the skies and keep enjoying those birds. 
we'll leave the webinar open for a couple of minutes if you'd like to leave any comments for Christian. And thank you all so much for joining us once again. Stay safe, everybody. And we will see you next week for our Sand Parks talk. Good night, everyone. And thanks for joining us.